Chapter 4, Geriatric Pharmacology. Adverse Drug Reactions and the Geriatric Population. The increased incidence of adverse drug effects in older adults is influenced by two principal factors, the pattern of drug use that occurs in the geriatric population and the altered response to drug therapy in older adults. Older adults are much more sensitive to the adverse drug effects of drug therapy, and many adverse drug reactions impede the patient's progress and ability to participate in rehabilitation procedures. Adults typically older than age 65 compose about 13% of the U.S. population, but receive 34% of all prescription drugs. So we can see where this is going to be a problem if they're receiving the majority of the, the medications and the pharmaceuticals that are out there. We'll come back to this list in a bit, but note that there are many different drug trackers that are out there. Um, Hippocrates, RxList, WebMD, um, even sometimes your EMR might have a drug tracker. I think it's really important that you figure out um, what drug tracker works for you and understand how to use it. Um, we will be using it later on in this, in this lecture and you'll have to um, use something, whatever system you have, to um, see interactions that might be happening with drugs. But it's good to, to find one that works for you so that you can use it in the future with your patients. I tend to use this one um, a lot. Um, I tend to use Hippocrates myself at the clinic, and that way I can put in drugs, um, find out a little bit more about the, the medication they're using if it's something that I'm not familiar with, and then also just see if there's any specific interactions that I need to be aware of when I'm working with my patients. Polypharmacy is defined as the excessive use or inappropriate use of medication, specifically uh, the use of five or more medications. And this becomes a vicious cycle. Thinking about some of the patients that you've seen in some of your clinicals or maybe even your grandparents um, and seeing how they, they start to get more illnesses or more issues as they get older. And so because of this, patients are prescribing them more, or I'm sorry, physicians are prescribing them more drugs. And whenever they start to take drugs, any drug will have some sort of a side effect. And if we're taking compounding drugs, we're getting compounding side effects. Sometimes these side effects are seen as symptoms. So our patients might complain of dizziness, um, joint pain, uh, headaches, blurred vision, all those kind of things. And occasionally they'll go back to their doctor and let them know any of these side effects that they might be having. And a lot of times a patient or a physician might just go ahead and prescribe them more drugs to counteract the side effects. Maybe realizing that these are due to a side effect or maybe even realizing that, or not realizing that they're due to a side effect and going ahead and prescribing a drug anyway. So we need to be aware of that. Um, the negatives with these kind of things are you're going to have patients that maybe aren't going to adhere to the, the schedule that the physician put them on as far as the prescription medications go. And it's an increased financial burden. I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the uh, donut hole when it comes to Medicare um, pharmaceuticals, but the donut hole um, alludes to the fact that once a patient has hit a certain dollar threshold for the year, Medicare will no longer pay for those medications to be covered, and therefore the patient has to pay 100% of the cost of those pharmaceuticals until they get back out of the so-called donut hole. This donut hole can last anywhere from you know, one month to three months. Um, and it can be anywhere from $1,000 to many thousands of dollars. And for some of our patients that are on a fixed income, this just isn't something that they can handle. So if this becomes a financial burden, patients are gonna choose not to take certain medications. I've had this happen in the past where um, patients have chosen, I'm just not gonna take these certain medications. Um, but I've had to have the conversation with them that they need to talk to their physician to make sure the doctor knows that they've fallen in this donut hole and see if there might be something they can do. Maybe the doctor can find a generic medication they can take that might be cheaper. Um, maybe the pharmaceutical company might have coupons to make it a little bit less expensive. Or maybe what we can do is figure out what medications might be causing the side effects and take get rid of the side effects one way or another and maybe not have to take so many medications. So I think that's really important to make sure that we know what medications people are taking. 
And looking at that drug interaction list that we discussed earlier, it's really important to know which drugs patients are taking and why and what, um, what interactions they might have, especially from the PT standpoint. When we get them up and start doing exercise and activity with them, we need to know if this is going to be a negative effect with them. I'm also starting to see a lot more of our patients take CBD products, so CBD oil, um, creams, all kinds of things like that, um, which are having some effects on them. Um, again, we don't maybe know the potency of each medication they're taking, and these aren't regulated at this point. So we don't know if somebody is taking um, a very strong uh, CBD uh, potion or one that's not so strong. So it's something we really need to take into consideration when we're talking with our patients. Most of my patients, even as of now, are really hesitant to tell, to tell me that they're taking any sort of CBD products. Um, they might whisper it to me and say, I'm taking CBD oil because um, they don't want to say it out loud because they feel like this is a bad, negative thing. And I think that's where we can also have those conversations with our patients to let them know that this, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you, they need to be willing to talk to their pharmacist and their physician about the fact that they're taking these. And, you know, especially if they're helping them, they need to know that. And again, that can have side effects that can interact with the other drugs that they're taking. So just letting our patients know that it's normal and it's okay and it's good for them to talk to their doctor about this. Moving on to pharmacokinetics. Um, this is the study of how the body handles a specific drug. I'm including how the drug is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and then excreted as well. This is all a normal process of aging. Um, versus a disease of illness. So we need to, to keep to take that into consideration that as we get older, um, our body is going to react differently to these drugs. The figure on the right hand side of the slide shows changes that are associated with aging regarding how the body handles medications. Drug absorption in the older adult has some significant changes, including decreased gastric acid production, decreased gastric emptying, decreased GI blood flow, diminished area of the absorptive surface, and decreased intestinal motility. And then moving down, we have um, drug distribution that may be altered in older adults because of severe um, or several physiological changes such as decreased total body water, decreased lean body mass, increased percentage of body fat, and decreased plasma protein concentrations. Drugs that bind to plasma proteins, such as drugs like aspirin and warfarin, may produce a greater response because there will be less drug bound to the plasma proteins and more of that drug can reach the target tissue. Also, drugs that are water soluble, such as like alcohol and morphine, will be relatively more concentrated in the body because there's less body water in which to dissolve that drug. The, uh, the total drug metabolizing capacity of the liver decreases with age because of reduction in liver mass, a decline in hepatic blood flow, and decreased activity of drug metabolizing enzymes. The cumulative effect of pharmacokinetic changes associated with aging is that drugs and drug metabolites often remain active for much longer periods than with younger adults and increasing the risk for toxic side effects. This uh, is truly evidenced by the half-life of drugs being substantially longer in older adults versus younger adults. And we need to keep that in mind when working with our patients. The next slide discusses pharmacodynamics, and that's important as well. That's the study of how drugs affect the body, including systemic drug effects, as well as cellular and biochemical mechanisms of drug action. So some tissues might be more sensitive to certain drugs, such as psychotropics and opioids, and some tissues may be less responsive to certain drugs, like cardiac drugs. Although some tissues might be more sensitive to certain drugs, other tissues might be less responsive. Age-related changes in cellular response must therefore be considered accordingly to each tissue and the specific drugs that affect that tissue. Consequently, pharmacodynamics may be altered in older adults as a result of systemic physiological changes acting in combination with changes in drug responsiveness that occur on a cellular or, or even a subcellular level. These pharmacodynamic changes along with the pharmacokinetic changes discussed earlier help explain why the response of a geriatric individual to drug therapy often differs from the analogous response in a younger individual. So going back to using some sort of um, drug check like Hippocrates, and so this shows just a screenshot of Hippocrates. Um, if you've not used these before, go ahead and try using them, and we will use them later. 
But thinking about aspirin and warfarin, I mean, I would think most of you all would know that um, that just increases the risk of um, bleeding with using the two of those together. So making sure that if our patients are on warfarin and they're telling me they're taking aspirin for the headache they had today or for the knee pain that they have today, making sure that we're having those conversations with them or making sure that they're talking to their pharmacist or their physician about those. And then with Tylenol and NyQuil, sometimes things that we don't even think about uh, might be an interaction. So for these two, um, we could have acetaminophen toxicity because both of those do have acetaminophen in them. So again, if you're not sure, using an interaction check like Hippocrates um, or WebMD is a great way to be able to look at this. And also letting our patients know about these as well because they can easily get on the websites or download the app and use them themselves. So I want you guys to look at um, patient X here. We have them taking Lasix, Zoloft, Losartan, Coreg, Pradaxa, and Crestor. And if you go ahead and put those into the drug checker, what would you be aware of when it comes to treatment? So with the last one we talked about acetaminophen toxicity, bleeding um, issues, which can and may and may not interact with what we're gonna do in physical therapy, but it's something for the patients to be aware of. But when it comes to these medications, there might be something more specific that we need to be aware of with our patients. Um, specifically, maybe we need to be checking their blood, uh, their, uh, checking their blood pressure, because uh, that would be important to know exactly what might be going on with this patient when we're working with them. Um, but again, that's, that's the benefit of using those kind of drug checkers. Adverse drug reactions. Um, there's all kinds of different factors that can increase risk in older adults. Uh, multiple disease states, like we talked about earlier, a lot of our patients might be um, dealing with multiple different um, disease processes going on, whether it's you know some sort of cardiac event, um, and then maybe uh, a risk of cancer or something else. Um, but all these comorbidities add up to different problems. Um, and then taking into account the medications they're taking can also um, be an issue there. The next one there's lack of proper drug testing and regulation. Um, so we talked about that with CBD oil. That's one that's becoming really popular. Uh, some of my patients are also doing you know, essential oils, whether they're you know, taking drops in a pill and taking them or dropping them on their tongue. We don't really know um, and there isn't proper drug testing on those, um, those types of things. So we don't really know what the interaction might be. So being really cautious about our patients and what um, reactions they might be having. Again, problems with patient education and not adher adherence to drug therapy. So if they're having some sort of reaction, um, specifically something that might be a negative reaction, the patients might decide not to take the medication, but maybe it's actually the medication they need to be taking. So we need to make sure that we're talking with our patients about discussing that with the pharmacist or the, the physician to ensure that they're taking the proper dosage or letting them know about the symptoms that they're having and why they might be concerned about not taking them. And then use of inappropriate medications. So sometimes our patients will be taking off-label um, drugs and not realizing it, um, using it for something else because one of their friends or family members or loved one takes it for something else and so they start taking it. Uh, and then also using somebody else's drugs We've had times where patients uh, might be using their spouse's drugs because maybe the doctor wouldn't prescribe them any more opioids. And right now that's becoming a big problem with physicians not being able to prescribe as many opioids. And maybe somebody has them at home and a patient decides to go ahead and take them. But again, we have to be honest with the, the medical community and let them know what's going on. So I had um, a family member of a patient that was taking um, another family member's opioids and went into the doctor, or actually went into the hospital due to some uh, you know, increased abdominal pain and they were wanting to put him on some sort of opioids but not realizing he was already taking them. So you have to be honest and have those conversations with the physicians because that's the only way they know how to properly prescribe you the medications you need or give you life-saving drugs that you really do need. So um, letting our patients know that if, if they're doing something off-label and not what they should be doing based on what the physician told them, they need to have those conversations with the doctors. And if for some reason they don't feel com comfortable having those conversations, they need to maybe find a new doctor or come up with a way that makes them feel more comfortable having those conversations because those are very important. 
So there's all kinds of different common adverse drug reactions um, and things that we just need to be aware of. Um, when it comes to GI symptoms, we're going to see this a lot with our opioids and our non-opioid analgesics. Um, some of my patients don't like taking the opioids because it really bothers their GI system, whether it makes them constipated, um, have a tummy ache, whatever it might be, but just, um, just talking with our patients through those kind of things and, and seeing what might be going on with them. Other common ADRs might be sedation, um, so helping the patients figure out if there's a better time for them to take their medication. More and more patients are relying on us to help them with that. Again, that's not really our our um, piece to, to tell them what to do and what to take and when, but having those conversations about, well, if this is making you drowsy, maybe it's something you need to talk to your doctor about, seeing if you can take it a little bit later in the day before bed, so that way when you're drowsy, you're sleeping and it's fine. Um, some sort of confusion issues. This could be due to a toxic level of a drug in a body, so making sure that if you start to see the patient and you've seen them before and normally they're lucid and they start becoming more confused, having those conversations and talking to them about that. Um, depression, this can be caused by all sorts of antipsychotics, alcohol, uh, those kind of things. One thing to note here when I put in alcohol, this is something to, to think about as well. We do have a lot of our patients and I, I work in you know outpatient um, private practice and and I see a lot of patients with chronic pain, whether they're younger or older, but one of the things I ask them about is their alcohol use, because some of our patients might be using alcohol as a way to decrease pain, and that's a CNS depressant, and we need to make sure that we're asking those questions, because if patients are using alcohol as a way of treating themselves um, and not actually taking the medication that maybe they should be or talking to their doctor about that and they're using alcohol to supplement that, Again, that's one of those things that we need to, to be talking about with our patients about to see if that's, that's truly how they're using that. Uh, another ADR, um, orthostatic hypotension. You guys are all familiar with that, I'm sure. Um, fatigue and weakness, dizziness and falls. Again, this is not a good thing that we want our patients dealing with. If they're having dizziness and falls, this is going to make doing rehab with them much more challenging and much more difficult. So making sure that we're understanding what's going on with our patients. Um, anticholergic um, effects, so dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, those kind of things again, and then extrapyramidal symptoms, any sort of movement disorders that your patient might be having, that's going to be difficult for them as well. For the treatment of pain and inflammation, your book talks about, um, and there are two types of analgesics, opioid and non-opioid analgesics. Obviously, this has gotten a lot of attention this last year um, in regards to the opioid analgesics. You know, physicians were using these pretty much carte blanche for a really long time, and so many of our patients got used to using those um, for not so severe pain. But really, we need to look at what opioids are for. It needs to be used for severe and constant pain, and ideally, it's used for a short time frame and then get them off those opioids. Um, examples of opioids are codeine, morphine, and oxycodone, um, and these drugs act by binding to opioid receptors in the brain and the spinal cord. One thing to note, they alter the pain perception, but they don't actually eliminate the pain. So it's not fixing the problem. It just makes the patient think that the problem is feeling better. There are definitely some um, ADRs associated with opioid analgesics, including sedation, mood changes, mood changes, and GI issues. Moving over to the non-opioid analgesics, um, this is going to be used for more of the mild to moderate pain. Um, Examples of these would be some of your NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, corticosteroids, and acetaminophen. These can be used for a much longer term period of time, but we still need to be careful of, of those as well and how long somebody might be taking them. But so many of our patients now are um, not being prescribed any opioids, especially after surgery, maybe only two or three days worth of opioids and then moved over to the non-opioid analgesics um, to get the, the pain a bit better under control. Um, so with the non-opioid analgesics, we're going to see um, these drugs produce ADRs such as analgesia, decreased inflammation. Um, oh, I'm sorry, these are not ADRs necessarily, but they are um, side effects. Analgesia, so decreasing the pain, decreasing the inflammation, decreasing fever, um, and anticoagulant effects. Cardiovascular drugs. Um, these drugs are used for obviously any sort of cardiovascular type issue like hypertension, CHF, angina, hyperlipidemia, and coagulation type disorders. 
This is where it's really important for us as PTs and PTAs to be monitoring blood pressure and, and heart rate during these changes. We want to look at this before, after, and during PT as well so that we know what the, what the body is doing, especially if these patients are on these cardiovascular drugs. If somebody's on statins, um, these can cause some serious muscle pain and inflammation. Um, clinicians should really be alert to any sort of muscle pain or weakness that doesn't uh, follow the musculoskeletal guidelines that we all know about. Um, if, if they're getting new pains or aches that don't, don't really add up, we need to make sure that we're referring these patients back to their doctor immediately. I've had a few patients that have had some serious issues when it comes to having some muscle pain and, and just joint pain. And, and again, this really does come down to muscle pain, not so much joint pain, but they might think it's my knee that hurts. But then when you start asking them about where the pain is, they might point more to their quads or their hamstring, maybe into the lower leg, like the gastroc. Um, and we need to ask a little bit more questions. You know, when did that start hurting? What's been going on? What has changed? Um, and being aware of that, I had a patient that ended up having a, um, a torn gastroc due to um, taking statins for her um, hyperlipidemia and they had to get her off it very, very quickly um, due to that. And the pain lasted a long, long time because she had these tears in there. So being really cautious of that. So it's one of the things that doctors tend to tell patients to be aware of. But again, maybe a patient's been taking a statin for a really long time and nobody's really checked up on that. And maybe they've been doing fine for a couple of years, um, but we might be aware of that if, if um, We've been doing exercises with our patients and we're stressing them a little bit more and stressing their body a little bit more and they come back in the next visit and complain of having a lot more calf pain in one side than the other. You know, making sure that we're doing our due diligence to check and see what might be going on with the patient. Um, you know, it could be a blood clot. It could be a, a statin um, ADR that we're seeing here as well. So making sure that if there is something going on, um, getting it checked out. You can use, you know, maybe a more experienced clinician to kind of look through things and see. But if you're still not seeing anything that, that adds up, making sure that you're referring these patients back to their doctor immediately. Um, and medication should always be combined with exercise and lifestyle changes um, to make sure that we're getting a normal balance between the, the um, supply and demand of the myocardium. Diabetes mellitus, um, we're seeing much more patients or many more patients that are being diagnosed at a younger age with diabetes than ever before. Obviously this class is a geriatric class, but it's something that we need to take into account um, because maybe even some of our geriatric patients as time goes on have had diabetes for decades, not just a few years. So we need to make sure that we're alert to signs of low blood glucose levels, such as headache, dizziness, confusion, nausea, sweating, fatigue. When it comes to scheduling and dosage, we need to make sure that we're coordinating medications with PT. Um, specifically, if we have somebody that might be in a hospital setting or skilled nursing setting, um, using them, those medications to, to help augment or um, improve the therapy that we might be having with our patients. One easy way to think about it is analgesics to improve the ability to participate in therapy, like following um, you know, total knee replacement, um, making sure that we're talking with the nursing staff or the doctors to ensure that we're getting the, the patient the best care possible. Um, any patients that might have like a, a Parkinson diagnosis or um, pseudo Parkinson like symptoms, uh, if they're taking medications, making sure that they're taking that a short time before we see them so that they're at their, their peak performance level when working with us. Uh, medications can cause adverse effects and impair a patient's cognition. And we need to make sure that we're taking those or that the patients are taking those at a time that causes the, the most um, least amount of disturbance in their body. Considerations. So I want you guys to go back and use your uh, medication checker that we talked about earlier and look at these medications and see if there might be some specific concerns when it comes to using these medications together. You don't necessarily need to know this for the quiz. Um, or the test necessarily, but I want you to start to dig in and dive into what, what these symptoms or adverse effects these might, patients might be having with these specific drugs so that you know how to, to help them the best way possible. Here's another example of a patient and their medications that I want you to check and see what, what concerns you might have with this patient. And again, making sure that we're asking all the right questions or getting a full list of what the medication, what medications the patients are on. 
Um, so many times, especially our geriatric population, will have a printed list in their wallet or their purse. So I just tend to ask them if I can get a copy of that because that's the easiest way to be able to look and see exactly what they're taking. But again, making sure that we're asking, is this your entire list? Have you added anything? Have you gotten rid of anything on this list? Because sometimes, again, patients will forget to update their list when a new medication is added or um, taken away. Um, maybe patients are taking vitamin D because they heard that that's good to you know, make their bones strong. Dr. Oz on TV told them that they should start taking it, so they've added it in. But is that something we need to be concerned about with this patient? So just, again, making sure that we're looking at that. So for your own benefit, I would go back and, and, and do this as a little um, um, assignment as well. Again, nothing that we're going to be grading on, but just looking at that. One other one. So again, this is you know a patient that... Um, I would definitely diagnose as having polypharma polypharmacy and taking way more than five medications. But this is quite common for our patients to be on a handful or a couple handfuls of medications and just making sure that we know what they're on, what it's for, because every once in a while I come across a medication that I'm just not sure what it's being used for. Um, and it's good to just refresh my own memory and then also see if there's any specific interactions I need to be aware of when working with this patient in therapy. And then just some final thoughts that I have when it comes to um, pharmaceuticals and your patients. Um, I would also make specific note about the pain medication that your patient is taking. For a while, Medicare um, guidelines dictated that we ask every medication that patients are taking, and I still try to do that. It's not mandatory like it was before um, with Medicare guidelines, at least not in the outpatient realm. But I think it's something to, to make sure that we're understanding. So one of the things that I really like to stress is the amount of pain medication somebody's taking, especially if they're in um, and the doctor prescribed them to come to therapy due to some sort of pain event or, you know, low back pain or recent knee surgery or something like that. I will ask them specifically how many pain pills they're taking a day and when they're taking it. Because um, I think that's really important to know because so many times patients might tell you later on, maybe in two weeks or a month later, they don't really feel like they're getting any better. But then when you start asking them again about their pain medication, they'll tell you that they're taking very little or maybe no pain medication. So they feel good enough to go without the pain medication. So again, if you've documented that from the get-go, at least now you'll know where they started and where they ended up. Um, if your patients have specific questions, um, or if you have questions, ask your patient, you know, what, what medications are you taking and why? Um, if they're not sure, you know, you might have them check with their doctor um, and especially have them check with, make sure one doctor is watching all the medications that they're taking um, because so many times patients will be getting medications from different physicians and maybe they're not talking to one another to tell them what they're actually taking. And if you have questions, then call their doctor specifically and ask those questions about your patient. At the end of the day, it's all about taking care of our patients.